Jean-Pierre Shihozawa is an artist and art educator who has traveled the world to study and teach his own painting workshops. Between America, Europe, and Asia, Jun turned challenges into opportunities, shaping his own creative path along the way. You can find Jun Pierre's website at junpierre.net. That's J U N P I E R R E. Join us today as we talk about how to cause desired life changing events, finding your purpose in times of self doubt, and Jun's number one tip to improving your art without even picking up a pencil. Hi, I'm Anya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etcher, meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. Okay. Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre? Hi. Pierre? Uh, Jean- yeah, Jean-Pierre. I Hello. love your name because it's the perfect mashup between Japanese and French culture. Yeah, that was the. I think that was the point of my parents. They um, definitely were, you know, they were searching for a name. Pierre actually happens to be the name of my, my grandfather as well. Oh. And <clears throat> June, I, yeah, they, they like that name as well. So, but every uh, everyone in my family, I mean, my brother and my sisters, we all have a mashup, which is kind of fun. <laughs> okay, I need to hear your sister and brother. Like, what are your siblings' yeah. names? Please tell me. Okay, I'll, I'll go in order from, from eldest. Um, so, so it's Bruno, Ken, uh, Maddie, Anne, which has become Marianne, but it was Maddie and Anne, and uh, Mika, Celine. I love your parents because your mother is French <laughs> and your father is Japanese, right? Yeah, exactly. So you come from a very creative family. Okay, this is the perfect way to start the interview. So tell us a little bit of how, tell us the story of how you got to be an artist. Okay, well, I think, um, well, speaking of my parents, uh, definitely I was encouraged a lot by um, my mom in particular. You know, she would always see me drawing uh, as a kid. Uh, I was one of those kids that would watch uh, Bob Ross painting uh, as opposed to Sesame Street. Like that oh. was very relaxing for me. <laughs> so she got me even a Bob Ross oil painting set, which was amazing. It had the, you know, the logo of him painting and everything. And I, um, and so I would just paint, I would find that uh, I would, I would paint to basically like to relax, to just sort of chill out, to zone out. And, um, but I, of course, like any kid, I was also interested in lots of other things too. Uh, I would play sports, I would play games with my friends, you know, things like that. Um, I think where it really kicked in for me was, so we, I was born in New Jersey, in the States, and then I moved to Minnesota at the age of around 10. And when that happened, you know, that's a, that's a difficult, well, I mean, it's moving could be difficult at any time, but uh, I remember just, it was, it was a little rough to adjust to this new place. And even though I hadn't, uh, I think that's where it really picked up, where I started to draw all the time, because I didn't really have many friends. I'd be just sort of adjusting to this new place. And so I just was, yeah, I would just be drawing. And, uh, and then of course, you know, into high school and everything and I, I just uh, I was kind of seen as one of the artsy kids at school and I guess it was just something that was pretty pretty much associated for myself like with what I with what I would do what I enjoyed doing um, it wasn't until maybe university and afterwards where I would question like is this is this really what I'm about is this really hmm. all I want to do And, and, and then, was that a, a hard thing to realize or like? Well, I think with, with, uh, because I was always doing it and because, well, I would associate myself with just, I like arts. People say, oh yeah, you know, he, if I, if I wanted to, if somebody wanted a, a cartoon drawing of somebody, maybe I could do a caricature of, you know, whether it's like a, a sports athlete or their pets or whatever. Um, but of course, then, you know, once you're moving on to the university or even after high school and you're just thinking about, okay, is this actually something that I could, 
uh, make a living? And that was a question that I, I couldn't really figure out, yeah. especially because at the time what I was interested in doing, um, it wasn't really, uh, it wasn't really, uh, I'd say the main emphasis in art schools. So I was mm-hmm. much more interested in more realism. Um, I would, when my, uh, you know, like when my high school teacher would see me drawing things that were more, I was trying to do more realism or uh, figure drawing. Um, he would just be like, you know, that's that's not exactly. You don't have to do this if you want to go into illustration. That's fine, but let's try to do something different. And I said, well, actually, I really like doing this too. <laughs> and I think that was just confused me overall because it was what I wanted to do, but um, there wasn't, as far as let's say being a fine arts major, say, yeah, it wasn't exactly what was being taught and uh, for that degree. Okay. So, and yeah. then, so you went to university, and then, and then, so then I went to. And then uh, I went to a, just a, uh, a large public school in, in Minnesota, which uh, was, uh, it was a very big school, you know, like a lot of students, it's a very good school, um, but it was one of those where there's just many, many people. And I, I think I was like a lot of, you know, freshmen and first year university students, I was just trying to uh, find, my, find my way, find whatever courses I was interested in and I kept um, sort of turning back in the art department and mm-hmm. and at the same time the reality of what that might mean to have just a you know fine arts degree uh, was pretty was pretty glaring there's there's a lot of people would say you know it's going to be very difficult afterwards to make a living with just this type of degree and so that was a message that I just I just was I just uh, it was almost the, the First thing I would say, like, uh, I think I'm going to be an art major, but even though I don't know if that's going to necessarily help me, you know, it was, it was tied to this, to the, uh, to the education, mm-hmm. but, but I, I, it didn't really matter. I mean, I just couldn't help it because I didn't really consider what else I could do. I mean, I was, there were other fields that I could have, uh, you know, that I was also interested in. But it was just as far as what where I wanted to put my energy, it was always in drawing and painting. Okay. Um, but but that was around and it was during this time in university where I was like, yeah, I, maybe I maybe I should reconsider this. Um, maybe this is. And when you say reconsider, maybe this is do you mean like not pursuing art at all, or just figuring out the kind of art path that you want to take? Yeah, even not not doing art at all. I oh mean, at least at least in a sense, like not as like a as a as a, a field or a profession. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought about um, there was a one semester. So one of the benefits of going to the school was that it was uh, it had lots of programs that like study abroad programs, um, and I I really took advantage of this. Uh, one semester I went to Quebec. And that helped with my French to study French. Um, but then, but I wasn't doing much art. I was just sort of focusing on other things and um, other studies. And and when I came back, I remember thinking like, I'm not even. I haven't really picked up a pencil to draw in you know months. And it was a very strange feeling. And I, and I felt I, I felt like I was on some sort of uh, momentum to move away from it. Okay. And. Um, and I mean, part of that was, I think, like I said, like that voice that was there, it's like, what am I going to do afterwards with a degree in, in arts? Am I just going to try to, you know, this is, of course, this is before the internet, really. I mean, okay, there was the very beginning of email and stuff, but, and um, so. What year was this? So I was, this was around two, 2000. Okay. Yeah, 2000. And, uh. I ended up uh, just kind of being in a funk, really. <laughs> I realized it was I didn't I didn't I didn't understand it at the time. There was other stuff that was happening in my life, but uh, I didn't understand it at the time. But I, I do think that part of the funk had to do with the fact that I really wasn't making as much art during that time. Um, I was, you know, 
I was distracted. I was um, my energy again, whether it was through other classes, studies, uh, it was just, it, it, it wasn't being put into like, let's say creative energies. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, yeah, so I had to, I had to kind of deal with that process for a little while. <laughs> and how long did it take you between realizing something was uh, off and getting back to art? Well, <clears throat> let's see. So one one night, really, it was sort of this flash. Um, I was, uh, I, I just, I, I just had this feeling like I wanted to study more than just even the art classes that I was taking. I'm talking, you know, like when you're doing drawing 101, painting 101. I mean, I knew that I wasn't drawing much. And, but I just like, I, but I just want to know more about the, like, like the deep history of, of, uh, you know, art and other parts of the world. So I checked out, um, on the university, what was offered for just like, um, study abroad programs. And there wasn't so much offered. <clears throat> there was, there were, there were some programs, but it wasn't really tied with art. And I was interested in going to Europe. Honestly, I was, I was interested, you know, my mom being French, I just been in Quebec and I, I just wanted to know more about like this huge heritage and history of, of, of painting in particular that really wasn't covered so much, uh, in some of the classes I had taken. I'm talking about my actual painting classes. Mm -hmm. So I, I just randomly, again, it was middle of the night, sort of, I found a program in based in Greece. And it uh, seemed incredible. It seemed like almost too good to be true. And I, uh, it was just like an independent program. And they were really uh, emphasizing sort of ties to the uh, artists of whether the Italian Renaissance or even ancient Greek artists. And I was so intrigued by this. So I just, you know, 3.30 in the morning wrote a quick note or message to the director of the school. And then I, I went to bed, and then the next morning there was a response, and I couldn't believe it, um, from the, the director, and it was this incredible response. Um, <clears throat> I'll never forget it. Uh, the guy's name is John Pack, <laughs> who's now a really good friend of mine. Um, and he, it was like a voice sort of calling out to me saying, like, hey, here we are, like, let's, like, you could, you could, you could do this, you could maybe, um, find something here. So anyway, that was a way that, that ended up were, um, with me going to the school in Greece. Um, first it was in Italy. It starts in Italy and then it goes to Greece and it was an incredible program. And then that really sort of in a lot of ways saved, wow. saved me. It saved how I felt about um, my art. This is so, very poetic. You had to get away from art to realize that's what you wanted. And then you just came back and dived in and I do not want to digress and then go on a tangent, but I have to say to everyone who's listening, like, the power of reaching out yeah one tiny email one text even now with the internet and social media it's so easy to just reach out to someone ask a question and it can lead to so many outcomes i'm so glad you 100 percent, absolutely yeah and um you know sometimes i think about what we do in the middle of the nights or at the end of the day when we're really tired mm -hmm. where there's almost this uh lack of of caring or being so, uh, you know, hesitant to do things. Um, I know when I'm painting, a lot of times I'll do some of the most crazy marks or moves at the end of a painting session late, like late at night. And I'm just like, I don't even care anymore. And I'll just sort of do like a big and heavy like ink wash. Work. And I'll just, yeah, and I'll go to bed and then I'll be like, I'm not sure if that's even going to work or not. And then I wake up and be like, okay, actually that's, yeah, yeah, that, that, that'll, that'll be fine. I can live with that. Yes, I can relate to that <laughs> so much. When I just stop caring is when my best work comes out as well. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Why, why do you think that's a thing? Why do you think we care so much about, you know, making the perfect thing? It has to be like under those things that we mentally set ourselves. Why do you think that's a... Because that's with everybody. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's because we have, uh, you know, a lot of voices in our heads just saying, you know, mm, that might not work or, you know, there's, there's a lot of barriers in place. Um, um, when I say voices, it might just be our imagined voices of what somebody else might say. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody else might see what you're doing, 
they might there might be some imaginary criticism mm-hmm. that is really ultimately it's just yourself fear yeah fear fear uh you know i i think about how one could be could have the most um supportive network of friends of family of of, of resources mm-hmm. but still be blocked you know still have to uh you know, if they're not really supportive of themselves, they'll 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 struggle. It'll be very difficult. So, yeah, I was I would say like you know if, if you're able, to, <clears throat> you know if you're able to be just self supportive, just for yourself, that is the most important thing because um, you could even have and I've and I've seen it. You know, students who've had bad art teachers, um, unsupportive parents not really resources, but because they have, they believe in themselves, they do great. They make a lot of progress and then they end up just doing, you know, uh, make, making uh, their, their living around it. So that's a really, that's a golden, golden thing that you just touched right there. So that sounds like an art struggle that you have to overcome or learn how to overcome. Can you tell us a little bit, like, how did you, when did you realize that was a thing and how did you overcome that? So, uh, as, I, as I mentioned with the school, so it's called the Aegean Center. And I, I remember um, that was like I found a, uh, just like a, a circle of, 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 of people that were very like-minded. And I think that was important for me there, to see that there was, there was um, Artists that were still creating just for the sake of art that weren't really it wasn't about just being Very clear about the idea that it's not about a job actually like the, If you're just doing art because it you know, it helps you to Process the world if it helps you if, if it's just your creative outlet your creative output then you know you You uh, you ought to do it and it's, it's, it's more important than just doing it for, for paycheck. It's never really about that. And I think that message was so resonant and it just came in. So at such a, a perfect moment for me that in a way, like once I just, once I received that message, it was like a signal, you know, like when I have the, like uh, those science fiction movies or whatever, uh, you know, like when there's like a call out from to another planet, <laughs> and then the aliens hear that signal and they're like, they respond. It's just like, they just needed to have that response. Um, it was like that. And, and once I received that, I, 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 it was sort of no looking back for me. And um, I, I guess I just said, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I do. And, and, it, and I knew it, it was not, it wasn't, uh, you know, fairy tales and what do you call it? Like all sugar and <laughs> happiness i mean i they were very clear about it. like it was it's going to be a struggle and it, and it ought to be a struggle in some ways because that's how you learn and that's how you grow wow so that was i was very very fortunate like you know i often wonder about that like how i uh, you know how these things happen you know serendipity random occurrences what happens what we do in the middle of the night and then also of course like you said making that um the you know just sending out that message and then having being fortunate to have that message be received and returned wow thank you okay now jumping back to our previous conversation so you're in art school you're in university you flew you're traveling all over getting a lot of information how did you get from that point to where you are today because now you're teaching everywhere you were supposed to go to japan this year of 2020 but <laughs> thank you yeah. covid for nothing <laughs> uh, yeah yeah um so that that's you know it's just well okay back to what i was just saying i mean that with that the the spirit of just like i'm just going to try to do this and put my all into it um a lot of it was that a lot of it is just like i'm because one thing i think i've learned meeting other artists art educators is that uh Every everybody has to hear it here. <laughs> it's, it's your adorable daughter. She's a part yeah, of the daughter. podcast now. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Um, so it's it's that everybody has their own path. You know, everybody has their own way of 
making making it work for themselves, which is always fascinating, which is why I think like what you're doing is, is really fascinating because like you, you'll ask about the stories of all these individual uh, artists. And, and it's really a great question to ask like what, how they did it. I mean, I ended up, um, yeah, I, I ended up becoming a teacher at this very school after, you know, exhibiting, I did, you know, I did, uh, I lived in Paris and in Tokyo, and while I was there, I was a, basically a, a working artist with, you know, day jobs, gigs on the side to, you know, support myself. You know, mm-hmm. I would I was living in a tiny little flat. Actually, I was living in a house, a shared house in Tokyo, and I had a very small room. It was an eight tatami mat room, and I would do these huge uh, Paintings that would fill up the entire room from wall to wall. Oh my god! But I didn't have a, I didn't have a studio. It was very unhealthy because I was painting in oils. I I don't recommend. You're sleeping it. with the smell of oil. It was. I would have keep. I would keep my window open. Oh my um, goodness! It was just a. It was really. I don't Insane. advise. Yeah, but um, but that's what I I would do that while also I was teaching English at the time, mm. and um. <clears throat> And then I ended up going back to the Aegean Center because Jane Pack, who was the, who is the, uh, the studio arts director there, and basically the, the teacher I learned the most from, she she was taking a sabbatical, and that was an incredible message to receive. Talking about like messages being sent across like galaxies, like that just hit me when I received that in my inbox and I read it. It was like a bomb going off in my brain, like, oh my god. So I. I had to go, and I I I, I left <laughs> Tokyo. I thought I might be back because it was supposed to be just as a substitute replacement for like a semester, mm-hmm. and then it ended up I ended up staying on, just teaching, and I was teaching there full time for almost about eight years. Basically. Oh my god, one semester to eight years again, tiny things leading to big changes. Exactly, yeah, and that was. Incredible experience. I mean, I ended up meeting my wife there in Greece, it was in Paros, and um, and so uh, you know, my life completely changed. And also, I learned one of the most important things about, I think, with anything with art, but um, that teaching is actually really uh, such a beneficial way to uh, progress in yes. well in any field, but especially um, I felt that way with my art, with drawing and painting. Wow. How, how, how come? Well, because for me, I, you know, um, I was always drawing as a, from like at the age of, you know, five or four or five, I don't know. So I almost like how it might be hard to teach your own language. Like I found it hard to teach English, even as an English teacher, mm-hmm. cause I just never really had to think about it very much. Mm-hmm. I didn't really have to think about how and why I draw and painting I, I, I was there was more instruction um, especially from individuals like Jane and other teachers that I've had but with uh, you know when it comes to when it comes to my drawing I, I really had to break down why I'm doing the things that I'm doing and that's where teaching really helped to guide me and make me stop and think about my process so, um, for example, again, the imaginary voice is if I'm about to teach a class and student, in my mind, student A is going to ask, well, wait a minute, why did you do that? Now, maybe there will be no student A. Maybe, there, maybe there's going to be no questions asking me. But I feel like I have to be prepared for that question. So, for example, why, why do you draw the figure where you're starting with the rib cage? And I have to have an answer for that. Well, the, the rib cage will be a way to put in proportion the size of the skull. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because if I start with the skull, a lot of times the rib cage will be too small. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so things like that. And, and I have to just have these, I have to explain it for myself. And that, it educates myself why I'm doing the things I'm doing. And it also sort of prepares me, um, what, you know, when I, when I actually am teaching. So I always recommend to anybody, almost of any level, I'll say, look, if you have a chance to teach somebody something, try to do it. Just go for it. Because it will... Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, No, go for it. Because I'm just like, even if it's just giving uh, a critique on a piece of art. Absolutely. 
because because you have to really you're using like a different part of your brain to process what um, what it is you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did read about that because I find that fascinating. And uh, yeah, the part of your brain that relates to thinking is different than the part of your brain that relates to speaking. So it's like mm. inside in the the part that goes outside, that is in, like I kind of evolved the inside of the brain. I forgot all the fancy words. Uh, so I cannot sound extremely smart about something I read like uh, ages ago. But basically, when you have to talk about the things that you have only thought about, you are making connections between your brain that haven't been made yet. Right, right. And that I, is why I, I sometimes totally... it's so hard sometimes to try and explain why, because you haven't, you didn't vocalize it yet. And yeah. something new is forming in your brain. And that makes it click so much better once you're able to do it. It's amazing how the brain works. Well, I, 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 totally, I totally get that. I mean, that makes so much sense to me because I know that like, if I get excited about something and I, and I share it, you know, let's say if I just hear a bit of news or something that I, like if I read something, an article, and, it's, <clears throat> and it strikes me, and, and, then I, and then I talk about that article later to somebody, to a friend, or to my wife, or whoever, I will probably remember that article a lot better. I'll probably yep. remember the, the details a lot better because I'm not just sort of passively taking it in. Now I'm, I'm actually, I have actively. to sort of share the information. I have to explain it. And so that's why I encourage when people will, you know, sometimes poo poo when somebody's just like, you know, when they're just reading Wikipedia and then they, they talk about it and be like, oh, so now you're just a Wikipedia expert and, you know, you just read a page. It's, okay. I understand why people might be criticized for that, but actually that's, that's a way to sort of really um, take in the information and process the information and keep it with you. Uh, so, yeah, I, I am. <clears throat> I'm thinking about that a lot mm -hmm. because while we're um, while you're teaching, you also have to. Yeah, you really do have to use different parts of your brain. Mm -hmm. You have to. You have to like how you're explaining things while you're working. Um, I'm teaching online courses the past couple months actually because of what happened in. Uh, well, because of COVID, uh, a lot of my workshops I'm doing, you know, over online lessons, and mm -hmm. I've never had, um, you know, a zoomed-in camera on my own work mm -hmm. while I'm working. I mean, I if I'm if if I'm in front of a class, then I'm just, you know, um, I might be in front of an easel, and the class is behind me, mm -hmm. and they never really have such a clear magnified view of my of my hand as I'm as I'm painting say yeah. but now the camera is focused right on the paper right on my hand and they're looking <laughs> no at pressure. every little thing and so and I have to talk so just how to sort of explain what I'm doing plus uh, do it correctly you know because like there'll be times where I'm just like oh my god I just made that person's nose look massive because I'm trying to explain like about midtones and shadows and all this other stuff. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> well, I think you're doing a great job. And thank you for bringing up online classes because uh, we, ladies and gentlemen who are listening to the show, June Pierre is teaching at Etcher Lab. So at the time of this recording, uh, it's uh, the course is uh, going to come out in July. So probably a couple of weeks if you're listening to this right now when it's launching. Uh, head over to etcherlab.com forward slash studio and you'll find more about that. Uh, Jean-Pierre, and uh, before that, oh, and if you're listening to this on a very post-apocalyptic future, COVID-19 <laughs> is probably the reason the apocalypse started. And if you go and try to find it in oh, history wow. books, you can't find it because 2020 has been such a horrible year. And it's June so far that it's probably deleted from history because it's oh so bad. But uh, Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> I can't believe that it's, 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 it's June, but it's, it's practically July already. I know. It's, it, it is incredible. It, we talked, I think we talked about this before, but I mean, just how... Uh, I just don't understand the sense. I, I the, the the days, the weeks, the months—they all blur together. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, day four hundred and thirty-two. <laughs> My head is a mess. Okay, Jun, any last words for our listeners? Anything you'd like to say before we end the interview? Uh, well, just if you're um, if you're doing it, then great. Just keep doing it. 
you know, be, try to be your, you know, your biggest coach, your biggest supporter, encourager. Um, I know that's just easy to, to say, but um, it's actually not so easy to do a lot of times, as we all know. Um, and yeah, it, like be uh, be comfortable with making mistakes and even falling, falling down a lot. I mean, I look at my daughter, she's two, she just turned two, she falls Aww. all the time. She's <laughs> She is completely covered, like her knees are all scratched up and it's because she's running all over the place, but she's also, her sense of balance and control are totally progressing every single day. And it's because of these tumbles. And I think that's how it feels like sometimes, you know, you yep. do you're trying to do watercolor, you're trying to master washes and trying to make things flow the way you want. And it's a, it looks like a total disaster. And, but you know, you just do, you just pick yourself up to do some more washes and, um, I don't know. That's I guess that's about it. Yeah. yeah. If if no one criticizes kids from for learning how to walk, then why do you criticize yourself for learning how to paint? Especially with watercolor, that is such a versatile medium that you will teach. So again, at yourlab.com forward slash studio. And if you are listening to this on um, on Apple Podcasts or any other audio only platform, head over to our YouTube channel because uh, we have a cool video as well where you can see Jun's face and my background made by one of our team members, Jerrica Cruz. If you'd like this background, you can download it and um, and I'll shut up because I've, I think we've, uh, we've met our quota of minutes for the day. <laughs> now that the interview is over, let's try something out. So, June explained how verbalizing your process helps with art making. Have you tried explaining something out loud to a fellow artist? How did that go? Please share your story with us in the comments section of our post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash June. That's E-T-C-H-R-L-A-B dot com forward slash J-U-N. Oh, and before I forget, we're getting ready to launch June's watercolor course at etcherlab.com forward slash studio, S-T-U-D-I-O, so please head over and read more information. Like the podcast? Please help us by subscribing and giving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etcherlab.com forward slash go forward slash Apple. Until then, let's make more art.